All right, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome again Professor Dominic uh, from our partner university, uh, Southwest Palia University of Applied Science. And welcome to all my colleagues and then all the students. We are going to have a great uh, 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 general lecture today <clears throat> given by Professor Dominic. But before I uh, give uh, Professor Dominic to start, I would, I would like just to introduce uh, Professor Dominic, uh, Dr. Dominic. I hope I'm pronouncing well, yeah, uh, this right. Professor Dr. Dominic of der Heidi. Perfect, almost perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Professor Dominic is, um, is a, a, a fellow lecturer in the South Westphalia University of Applied Sciences that we also know as Fahou Sule. Uh, West, West, South Westphalia, and then he is the uh, he's expert in industry and electrical power engineering, and of course teaching quite many subjects, including electrical engineering, measurement, acquisition and conversion, and microprocessor technology, uh, system engineering, and microprocessor based system research on multi sensor data fusion 3d sense 3d sense reconstruction adaptive sensor networks and computer fusion and and much others many others yeah so um we will be listening today from professor dominic on the topic of aspects and challenges of modern sensor technology and after the general lecture then uh you will uh, you will you will be welcome to ask questions directly to professor dominic and i believe that today we are going to uh, learn something great something new in terms of modern sensor technology so i would like to welcome professor dominic to start the general lecture please sir thank you yeah boris thank you very much for the nice introduction and welcome all uh, greetings from germany i already told we have a wonderful summer day today in germany which is not so usual as you know and um, for us it's still morning 11 o'clock for you it's already a little bit late in the afternoon so i hope um, that i will actually um, have a, some dynamics so i would like to uh, introduce and invite you to actually use the chat if you have questions in between i always have one eye on the chat if you want to have something um, actually answered directly during the course yeah so um, what we will do today is that we will speak a little bit about sensor technology and why i think this is one of the very important aspects of uh, let's say modern technology systems and of course i will also give a small introduction of what i'm doing in my research and the talk is structured in a way that first of all we will speak a little bit as an introductory topic and um, because you all know there is a lot of you know modern aspects of technology which are actually everybody's talking about things like artificial intelligence machine learning industry 4.0 digitalization and stuff like that and i want to clarify a little bit within my talk that all of these let's say new fields of technologies are only possible due to also recent advance we do in the field of sensor technology of course everybody is more focusing on the data analyzing aspect on the machine learning aspect but without useful and reliable sensors these very it's, let's say helpful applications could never really be implemented in this context we will speak roughly about what is a sensor for us and usual let's say used signal processing techniques and then i will present a quite you know big case study where i'm talking about visual inertial scenery construction this is uh, actually an example from the field of 3d um, scenery construction with visual sensors and also inertial sensors and we use this as a case study on uh, really to show how complex modern sensors could be and what is very let's say important uh, when you want to develop them okay um, as said no problem if you have any questions in between just let me know in the chat and I will directly answer them that is not a problem so I will invite you so starting with the introduction I'm just showing some of the technological trends we can all see we can all feel they are around us one of the technolo uh, technological trends I want to cover here is the aspect of 
autonomous driving. This is, of course, as you can imagine, one of the biggest topics in Germany right now, because in Germany, we have a lot of, you know, traditional car manufacturers. And in recent years, you all see uh, the car manufacturer, like, for example, Tesla, who are actually challenging our classical German car manufacturers like Mercedes or BMW or Volkswagen or whatever they will be. And of course, now this has become a technological race for them because we are talking about the e-mobility side of things and about the autonomous driving side of things, which are from, um, from uh, our point of view, very, very important to, to really get covered. And of course, when it comes to autonomous driving, this is one of the aspects and trends where I can immediately see that everybody, when it comes to autonomous driving, is talking about the aspect of machine learning. And they're talking about data, data analysis. They are talk, talking about artificial intelligence. But what is really important from the autonomous driving point of view is also the sensor side of things. So let's speak a little bit, first of all, about the goal of autonomous driving. And in order to actually define the level of autonomy, who is actually, um, actually um, received, um, there was, they defined these kind of six different levels. Um, level zero is usually the level we are currently using in most of our cars, which means that we have no assistant at all. I don't need to explain, we all know that. And um, then level one, needs uh, means um, assisted and you see that they define these different levels by the kind of interaction which will not be longer necessary by the human for example in level one they say this is the level where we reach the goal where we can forget about our feet that means that the car is at least able to um, actually increase the velocity decrease the velocity brake automatically things like that um, here, you already know that there are assistants available already in modern cars, which can do things like that. So you all know about cruise control, about adaptive cruise control, where the distance to the car in front of you is, let's say, tried to be kept on a constant level, things like that. But this is not already autonomy, it's just an assistance system. Um, then furthermore, we go to the next level, level two, which means, okay, we can forget about our hands, which would mainly mean that the car is able to steer itself. Also there, there are partially some successes, which we can see in our everyday cars. For example, I drive a car which can, has a lane assistant, which is able in specific circumstances on specific roads with specific speeds to keep the car within a specific lane and you know it's even steering automatically a little bit yeah this is already let's say achieved but also just up to some extent the next level would be forget about our eyes so that would mean that we have a highly automated car which means that okay we do not even need to actually observe the street in front of us because the car will take care and as you immediately see, the transition from level two to level three is a very big transition because if we want to forget about our eyes and the car should do it by itself, we really need to have a completely different sensor concept for the cars. Um, you know that in autonomous driving, one of the discussions which we already have is a non-technical one, but it's, it's more a, a question from ethics which means who has the responsibility if something will go wrong. So if it's uh, still a failure of the human who sits behind, sits behind the steering wheel, or if it's a problem which we can relate to the technical system. And there it becomes very interesting on how to implement these kind of stuff. And because in level three, we are still talking about that, okay, we do not need to observe the street continuously maybe we can read or something like that but we are still it is still necessary for us to observe the behavior of the car and that would be the transition to level four where it means okay we can even you know forget about our mind the car will do everything and we do not need to take any responsibility and the final goal of course would be level five where we do not even need to have a passenger which can uh, which allow the car to drive fully autonomous okay so as you see this is our goal, level five. We have cars who can really navigate completely without any passenger, with completely without any human kind of interaction. 
Yeah, so you call a taxi, but there will, will be a taxi which uh, has no driver in it. It will just, you know, open the doors you can enter, you type where you want to go, and it will drive completely autonomous. <clears throat> so, and what I think is at the moment a little bit of a problem is that in education, in, let's say, different fields, really, to achieve this goal, there is a lot of new stuff available when it comes to the algorithm side of things. But what we need to talk about is what is the sensor side of things. And for this, I just show an example um, from, from the same field. Um, I will just show you a short video. And what you see here is that we are talking about um, an autonomous car driving. So this is an autonomous car which is driving. Um, of course, there is still a passenger behind. And what we are mainly interested in is the sensor setup. Because if you want to do autonomous driving, your sensory information about the environment looks like that. And you see immediately how complex it is to realize a perception of the environment of the car. Because what, you're, what you need to do is, you need to be able to identify other cars in the scene. You need to have distance information from the other cars. So how far they are away, maybe how fast they are going. Uh, you need to inf have information about the different lanes, as you see. You need to have information from the traffic signs and so on and so on. And you see how complex it is to perceive this kind of information. And of course, this is the very core of um, combination of different sensors we have in our car. Here you see they have a specific setup on top of the car, um, which contains ultrasonic sensors, leader sensors, and so on. Furthermore, as you see, what they're also doing is to monitor the driver. Why it is important that they monitor the driver? Um, it is also important because they need to know if you're still observing, maybe if you're sleeping, if you need to have any request. Furthermore, you need to have voice recognition in order to give commands to the car. And we have a very complex set of sensors, which we need to fuse. And this brings us to the terminology sensor fusion in order to perceive a complete 100% image of our environment. For example, you need the classical image information, maybe to detect cars. But you need, need a different set of sensors, for example, to measure the distance to the car in front of you. And just when we are able to realize, to get useful information from the different sensors, we can have a complete detection of the objects and what we call in the research uh, of computer vision, scene understanding, which means that we are not just interested in object detection where we know, okay, there is a car, there is a car, this is the lane, this is a traffic sign. We want to have an understanding of the scene in a sense a human would have. Um, I just read a question in between. There is a uh, question. Um, yes, uh, of course, here is a question, maybe a very good and related to that. So I want to cover that immediately. There is a question here from uh, Mr. Anargaya, I hope I pronounced it correctly, and where he mentioned that Sony showcased a car based on camera sensors, but they are not really planning to build a car themselves. And it is obvious that we will have also for autonomous driving the same structure as we have today in car manufacturing. And I know the, let's say, um, development of car, classical car, very good, because as I said, we are working closely together with a lot of companies who are involved in generating and building a car. Um, the process is at the moment when, you when it comes to the big manufacturers, for example, like Volkswagen. Volkswagen, they are mainly interested to build the complete platform where they say we are responsible for building the car and some of the key components, for example, the motor or the classical engine themselves, maybe also uh, the gearbox and something like that. But the car manufacturers have only, let's say, part of the complete technological aspects in their own hand because one of the really drivers of you know, innovation in Germany in the German car industries are the sub-suppliers of these car manufacturers. Of course, when it comes to automotive area, we all know the big players, Volkswagen, Mercedes, BMW, Porsche, or whatever. But the real drivers of innovation, are in most cases, the companies below that area, the sub-suppliers. 
And of course, when I even talk about sub-suppliers, these are also not small companies. Uh, for example, here near Zost, we have the company called Hella. You probably have heard about them. They have also, you know, tens of thousands of employees. And they are, in a way, much more innovative. And we will see the same impact and the same structure, I guess, for the autonomous driving field. At the moment, we're talking about a company like Tesla, and we're talking about that they have more or less a technological advantage to build such a car. However, we shall not forget that Tesla is still, absolutely still, when it comes to total sales of cars, a complete player in a niche market. When you compare the amount of cars Tesla are actually selling and you compare it, for example, to Volkswagen, you see that it's a complete different structure. And what we need to achieve in both e-mobility and autonomous driving is that, of course, the big players start to come into the game and then they rely to a certain extent on the sub-suppliers. And that is, I think, the big difference and the big challenge we still have. We see that the Tesla is a very good car, technological advanced car, but they have difficulties with, you know, uh, production chains. They have difficulties with quality. They have still difficulties to really, you know, reach high uh, number of manufactured cars. They are actually building a complete new uh, manufacturing um, facility here near Berlin. So I'm really looking into that as well. Very interesting uh, what they are doing. Um, but I think we need to see what the big players will do. At the moment, for example, um, one of the big players in autonomous driving is definitely more in the Japanese. Um, the, the German ones, they are a little bit, you know, concerned, let's say, what will really do this autonomous way of driving with their product. Because the difference is clear if you are, you know, offering high price cars like a Mercedes or like a Porsche, uh, it is very important that you know, you're not just selling the car, not just the technological product, you're selling also that, you know, a certain feeling with it. Yeah, when you want to buy a Mercedes, you have a certain feeling to drive yourself a Mercedes. When you want to uh, buy a Porsche, of course, you do not want to talk about autonomous driving because you want to really have the fun of driving itself. So that is the difference. Okay, just short, short overview. Um, okay, and what's of course the final goal is the virtual driver. And as we see, what will also happen from my perspective is that we have a lot of new sensor technologies in the cars. We will also add additional sensor technologies outside the car to really realize an environment of autonomous driving. For example, that you will have a car to car or infrastructure to car communication um, setup, where, for example, traffic lights are also equipped with sensory units in order to select uh, what is the best option to uh, actually assign the right to drive and, for example, detecting other, um, let's say, for example, bikes, pedestrians and stuff like that, that will really also be important. That means at the end, we will have very complex sensor networks in order to achieve the goal of autonomous driving. And it needs to be clear, the machine learning part is very important, the data analytics part is very important, but you can only analyze data you have acquired and captured before. Therefore, the sensor part is as important as the algorithmic part. Maybe another technological trend which you mainly heard about is Industry 4.0. Uh, just a short historical, let's say, um, classification of Industry 4.0. Um, the first Industry 1.0. 1.0 is, of course, that we are talking about the mechanical production facilities we had uh, back, you know, 1800, something like that. Industry 2.0, we are talking about the first division of work, mainly driven by the inclusion of assembly lines. Industry 3.0 is, let's say, the point where we are currently still in, in most consents, which means that we have a highly automated production processes by using electrical components like PLCs, embedded systems, electrical motors and stuff like that. And what means industry 4.0 is that we are, will create a networked production in a sense that we have different autonomous machines which will communicate which, with each other in order to realize things like predictive maintenance, things like a self-optimized production chain, um, things like that. 
So this is often referred with the term Internet of Things, which means that at this moment, at this particular moment, it's mostly still humans who are interacting and communicating via the Internet, just as I just do in this very moment together with you. However, what we want to achieve is that we will want to work on a situation where we have a specific machine and the specific machine is able to analyze its status and is, for example, able to order their own spare parts it needs because it will know, okay, this part of my machine will break probably in a couple of weeks. So I need to order the spare part which is needed directly online from some other services, order the working team to do it. And this would be the um, case of predictive or proactive maintenance. So a machine tells itself, okay, I need to replace this particular piece because it will break. And of course, the self-optimization of production, which means that, for example, if I want to build a certain thing, I know I need these kind of raw materials, which comes from another machine and they're communi communicating with each other in order to optimize their performance. I give you also one example. Uh, one example I recently worked on, it's from the field of cement production. Yes, cement, you all know, is still the very base of our, let's say, building industry. And um, just very, very briefly, how is cement produced? Um, I, I was recently also in discussion, uh, very interesting, with cement producers from Indonesia. In Indonesia, there are some big cement producers, actually. And the cement production process is a very complicated one um, because it contains a lot of different steps which all are associated with a big set of parameters in order to uh, generate the final product, the cement. Mainly, just very briefly, you have a quarry where you get the raw material from, for example, limestone. Um, of course, you need to crush it. You need to actually give other particular raw materials to it, sandstone, clay, whatever it will be. There's the first big problem. Depending on the composition of your raw material, you need to always, you know, blend your different materials in order to achieve the uh, quality you want to have. And then you have a small powder, fine powder, more or less, which you need to bo burn or roast. This is usually done in a so-called um, calcination and rotary kiln process. So rotary kiln is mainly, you know, it's a tube, a long tube, two meters or more in diameter. It's slowly rotating and the material comes to this kiln will be actually heated up to temperatures above 1,500 degrees Celsius. So very hot where you burn the so-called clinker, which is the raw material, which is then further grinded to build the cement. And this is the next very complicated process because <clears throat> there is a, let's say, big dependence between this is the combustion process. This is the, these are the properties of the fuels I'm using for the combustion process. And these are, this is the composition of the raw materials because you want to achieve a certain set of characteristics of the final product. Um, the final, final product here coming from the kiln just needs to be cooled down. And then it's again mixed with other elements and grind it again because you want to have the small powder, as you all know, as cement. And then you put it to silos and you put it to whatever concrete um, station or whatever you will use it. And we just will focus in here on the combustion side of things because here you are usually using fuels in order to burn the clinker. And here is a look, what you see is, this is the rotary kiln you're looking inside. So the rotary kiln, this is the burner where you have a big flame. And this is the material which is actually heated up to 1,500 degrees Celsius. And here you see a typical situation. This is me in, uh, this is actually in South Korea, I guess, where I'm sitting in front of the control station. And we were talking about, okay, what can be the optimization? And uh, I try to understand what is, the usual procedure they are using to optimize their production. And for me, it was very obvious from the beginning that this particular person here is the most important person in the whole manufacturing process because what he is doing is that he's observing many different sensor readings. And based on his personal experience, 
he knows exactly, okay, I need more fuel, this kill needs to be rotated smaller, I need to have a different um, composition of the raw ma uh, materials and so on in order to achieve the best possible product. And of course, the real industry 4.0 approach would be now, okay, um, it is very good that we have a very experienced and dedicated person who knows what to do, but we need to try to actually generate a technical system which is able to do the same thing. There were many attempts to do that in the past, but they never succeeded because the process knowledge is so complex that you cannot generate a very simple model to do so. Um, and here, I just want to show you why this is really the case uh, when it comes just to the combustion process. As you see, you have a, a main burner in this system and the main burner is generating a certain flame. And now you're bringing different fuels into this flame. And of course, every different particle you have is all also burning in a different way. In these videos here, um, you see now different particles and how they burn out inside of the flame. And you see, of course, that the combustion behavior is always completely different. If you have paper fractions you're, uh, um, you're burning, you have, for example, a great variety of ashes you have. 3D particles, you have a long burnout. Plastic foils, they burn out immediately with not so much ash and so on. And therefore, to control this combustion process is a very difficult thing. And when you ask um, the guy from the control room, just please explain me briefly how this works. And you ask this guy, he will tell you immediately 100 different aspects he's actually looking at. And sometimes it's not even a systematic way where he says, okay, this sensor value is above 20 and this sensor value is below that. I do exactly that. It is often described by those guys like you need to read the flame. You need to read the process. You need to have it in your guts what exactly to do. So it's more like a subjective matter. And of course, that is not really um, satisfying when it comes to a technical complex process because you want to have this knowledge inside your technical system, inside your control system. And of course, what we try to do is, again, okay, we want to do this kind of thing in an automated way. And the very first thing to start with in order to realize it, to include a new set of sensors. And we focus just on the combustion process, first of all. <clears throat> and what you see here is, that we are actually included a fuel monitoring device based on near infrared sensors. Um, and what we get is the composition of the different fuels. So we know how many plastics they're in, how many paper is there in, how many biomass is in, what is the humidity of this fuel and so on and so on. So on the one hand side, we know about the fuel. And on the other hand, we are monitoring the combustion by means of infrared um, image processing. Here you see again, this is a look in, inside of the kiln and you see the flame and we are looking on the flame shape, we are looking on the temperatures, we are looking also on the on the shell of the complete kiln, how the temperature distribution, spatially distribution, turns out to be. And this is, this again was the starting point where people say, okay, now with this additional information we have, now it is really possible to come up with an idea to actually implement a system who is able to mimic the very experienced control room operator. And what we've done is what we generated a so-called digital twin, which means that we implemented by using of MATLAB Zimolink, maybe you know that software package, um, we implemented a complete simulation of the cement manufacturing process. So this digital twin mimics exactly how the real system would behave. And we can play around with different aspects, for example, characteristics of sensors. And what we are now able to do is that we have real world sensor readings. So we would know this is the combustion process behavior at the moment. This is the fuel process behavior at the moment. These are the other process vari variables like temperature, like pressures, whatever we will get. We can fit the sensor data into the digital twin and the digital twin will tell us how the real system would react when we play with some of these parameters in a specific way. And then we can run an automatic optimization algorithm 
where we are saying, okay, now with these sensor readings, please look for the best possible way to control the specific um, actuators we have. And then if we know that from our digital, tw digital twin, we give that set to the real system. And this is for us was a possibility to actually mimic the behavior of an experienced control room operator. But the digital twin approach would nothing would be nothing without the inclusion of the additional sensor data. The sensor data was really, you know, the cornerstone of this development. Okay. Mm. Okay, here's one uh, another question I would like to uh, cover. Um, I think Mr. Segara is the name. He asked about that he read some news about Chinese authorities, uh, which seems to dislike the existence of electrical vehicles or autonomous vehicles, because there is a possibility for spying and intelligence purposes and so on. Um, the, the question is, of course, yes, I, it might be that Chinese author authorities see that, but this is always always the case of course this is the case for very very complex autonomous driving cars but this would be also the uh, the point for any other complex technological system which you're getting into your country from a company from another country and especially the relation between united states which is the home country for tesla and china on the other hand let's say was not so good over the last years, um, especially to the Trump administration. They were confronting each other with taxes and with uh, things like that. So of course, they try to actually get rid of a foreign technological advanced cars in their own country and try, of course, to actually support their own manufacturers for autonomous cars, because China, to be very clear about that, is a big player in this field of technology definitely and but this is not just the case for autonomous cars so it might be that it's possible there and especially if you have a car where we clearly say okay the car is very advanced in the sense of actually sensing its environment um, of course i can see why people have actually a discussion whether this is really a good thing to do um, because the car sees everything from actually when it's on the street it sees everything on the street but of course it sees also a lot of information beside the street and it's also a point which is discussed in germany you know in germany or the european union uh, the protection of personal data for example is a very 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 sensitive topic and if you have now technological systems where you know they are capturing the environment all the time of course people ask hey, how we make sure that, for example, the systems are not able to recognize, ah, here, this particular person was driving at this particular time from this location to another location, and maybe also he was not driving alone, but he was driving together with somebody else. This would be a personal information which the technological system could if it's used in the wrong way, used for a wrong purpose, because they could monitor the behavior of people with these kind of things. And But this is, as I said, a discussion you have for all technological advanced things. For example, um, we had also, um, let's say, computer vision systems to monitor, for example, parking lots and stuff like that. And of course, people were asking the same questions. At the moment, uh, I'm not sure in Indonesia, but in Germany, they were developing uh, an app for corona tracing and the biggest concern is that the data could be used for different purposes that they could be used for example to monitor people because it mainly creates a list of people you've met on the streets and it was a discussion for weeks and weeks before they found let's say an approach which is completely functional but has no issues with the protection of personal data because it's a completely decentralized system. So that means that it shows me if I have any, you see, probably you see it's green, so that's good. Yeah, um, because it's tracing all the people I've met on the street, but with a non-centralized approach, it's nowhere saved. It's just using with anonymous tags. But as you can see, this is a, this is a topic which is not related just to autonomous cars. 
it is definitely, and I don't want to speak um, that it's not a problem, but it is definitely a problem. The more complex the systems get, the more data you're actually using to realize a technological function, the more critical and the more sensitive is the complete topic of protection of personal data. <clears throat> okay, yeah, I could go on and for, on with technological trends, as you see, artificial intelligence, addit uh, additive manufacturing, maybe you know that, these kind of 3D printing stuff, and it is always the same, sensors are in the very heart of all these applications. So why I am interested, now I already talked about uh, 30 minutes, and now it's time to introduce myself. <laughs> so my name is uh, Dominic Aufteide, as Boris already said. And why I'm interested in these kind of things, I'm professor for industrial measurement and metrology here at the South Westphalia University, and I'm dealing exactly with these kind of topic when it comes to the interface between sensing, signal processing, and understanding what's going on in a process. <clears throat> so therefore, I'm dealing with uh, modules in the field of computer vision image processing, sensors, signal processing, model-based design, all these kind of stuff. And of course, Due to the fact, we will see that in the, in the following slides, due to the fact that most of these systems are later on implemented as small embedded systems, I'm also teaching um, things like microprocessor-based systems, like um, embedded systems design and stuff like that. And um, here, just one short slide about the university where I'm dealing in. Um, as you know, we are probably we are spread about five cities in the west of Germany. I'm at the campus in Soest, which you probably some of you already know. I'm not sure if you already have been here or you're probably coming here. I would be happy to welcome you, some of you here on the campus. And we are, um, let's say for Germany, quite big university with 14,000 students, mainly in bachelor and master courses, mainly related to engineering economics. As you see, with agricultural engineering, life science engineering, we have also educational science. And let's say we are one of the big players of universities of applied sciences, which you might know in the German system, the University of Applied Sciences are those which are really dealing with, let's say, practical problems. So combining theoretical, high, uh, high value, theoretical academic knowledge with the realization of things in the real world closely related to the local industry. Yeah, this is what I'm personally doing. Uh, my, let's say, section I'm working in industrial measurement, um, you already know, multi-center data fusion. Recently, we have a lot of projects in the field of motion and gesture recognition of people um, in the field of um, um, health recovery and uh, stuff like that. Generally, computer vision, also in the field of autonomous driving, but also, interestingly enough, in the field of smart farming. So also the inclusion of sensor technologies into classical areas like farming and agriculture, monitoring of plants, but also monitoring of animals, yeah, which is also very important. Um, signal processing, smart uh, sensors and networks, and of course, classical image processing as well. Okay, now I've spoke a lot about sensors and why they're important, and I hope you follow me with that, that the inclusion of sensors is very important. The selection of sensors is very important. And of course, this is the guest lecture. So I want to also cover some of the basic stuff you shall know. So first of all, we need to take care of what is a sensor in a sense. When we are talking about the sensor and I try to formulate a definition. So first of all, a sensor can all, always be perceived as the interface between the real world and our technical system. So, for example, I'm here in a room now, as I said, for German purposes, it's quite, quite hot outside with 25 degrees. So in my room, it's also a little bit, little bit warmer today. And I would be interested to know in a technical system I want to develop, what is the temperature in this room? For this, I would need a sensor, which is, as I said, responsible for the translation of the real world temperature, the real physical entity temperature measured in Germany in degrees Celsius. This is what we call the measurement, so the value we would like to know. And the representation, and that is very important, the representation of the real temperature in our technical system, which we call, this is the measurement we take. 
Of course, as you all know, the system is not as easy as it looks like here. And of course, it could be very more, uh, very much very complicated when it comes to <clears throat> different physical entities we would be interested in. Temperature is maybe something we can easily measure. As you see, when I want to know what is the exact distance to the car in front of me, we would all see that the sensor is much more complicated. So, of course, it is a little bit more to a sensor like just this very simple view I just showed. Because in most cases, of course, in order to read a measurement in our technical system, we need to actually transfer the physical measurement, for example, the temperature, into an electrical value. Because at the end, we want to read the temperature as, for example, an electrical value like voltage, current, resistance, frequency, capacity, whatever it will be, any kind of unit which I can read with a technical electronic system. I cannot read temperature directly. I can just read, for example, a resistance, which depends on the temperature in the real world. And based on this sensor value, I could then derive again in the technical system, okay, that is the associated temperature. This is actually what it looks like. So let's uh, make the example with the temperature. We know, okay, we have a sensor, we have the temperature which we want to measure, which we call the measurement, and we select a certain sensor principle. And the sensor principle defines, okay, how the physical value we want to know relates to an electrical value we can measure. For example, for measuring the temperature, we could select a thermal resistance, which means that we have an electrical resistor, which is actually depending on the temperature. This would be the actual symbol we would use. And then we have a certain characteristic of this sensor principle, where we say, okay, for a certain temperature, we have a certain resistance. This is what we see, and this we call the characteristic or the characteristic curve of a sensor. And of course, in most cases, we are looking for sensors which would have probably linear characteristics, um, which would make our life easier. For, for example, such a thermal resistance, probably it's not a linear case, and we have a different characteristics. And of course, what is very important, that our sensor principle, which we are selecting, just depends on one physical entity. Here, we are defining a model where we know, okay, for a certain temperature, we get always the same resistance reading, the sensor value. And of course, this must be given, which means that when we define the sensor as a system, we have a certain measurement and a certain sensor value. And for example, in our case, the resistance R shall be a function which just depends on the temperature in a certain way. All the other elements within the relation shall be constants because otherwise, if we would have another physical unit inside of these equations, it would be very difficult because then we could not directly relate the sensor reading to the temperature which we are interested in. So this is the measurement principle we're talking about. <clears throat> so back to our example, our uh, definition. So we want to capture the temperature in the real world, which is the measurement. We have a certain sensor principle with a certain sensor characteristic, which relates sensor value to measurement. In our case, resistance as a function of the temperature. And then, of course, we need to evaluate the sensor value, the electrical reading, in order to calculate, okay, this is the temperature it relates to, which is basically just using the inverse curve. Yeah, so we are using the inverse characteristic in order to get the evaluation done. So this is the very simple definition of a sensor system. Um, I know this might sound trivial, but I always start when I talk about sensors with these kind of definitions because I know and I've seen over the past years that I'm even in higher semesters and I'm talking about sensors, these very fundamental principles are not 100% clear. And uh, of course, when these fundamentals are not 100% clear, much more complex applications cannot be really implemented in a reasonable way. Okay, let's move on. 
Um, okay, as simple as that is our sensor definition. We know, okay, we know, want to know a temperature and we want to measure it. That would be the characteristic curve of that sensor and we can actually get the real measurement. But of course, now we have a lot of problems with these kind of sensors. One of the biggest problems is noise. And I'm not sure if you already came across that term. I think so. Noise is basically a disturbance of our sensor reading. So let us assume our sensor shall read such a sinusoidal curve, the red one here. <clears throat> we are not reading just the real value, but usually we have some noise interfering with our signal. And this might affect definitely the quality of our sensor reading. I will give you a short example with a, a small uh, program I just, I just developed so we can actually simulate the behavior. So I'm starting my program. So uh, let us assume this sinusoidal curve here in, on top. This is the real value we would actually measure, we want to measure. So the ideal sensor would deliver such a signal. Perfect. I can tell you this will never be the case. Never. You will always have the interference of noise. And we are defining noise, and this is very important, as a random interference to your signal. Because when it comes to errors of sensors, we could talk on the one hand side about systematic errors, which means that, okay, from the principle, we have a systematic error of our sensor, which we are doing. But the good thing with systematic errors would be, we could easily come across these kind of systematic errors because, as the name says, we know this is the system behind the generation of this error, and then we can compensate. With the noise part, we cannot compensate because it's purely random. So it's really purely random. And as you see, so this would be the ideal sensor reading here on top. And this would be the noise added. So the final sensor reading would not look like this. It would look like this. You see that you have some, some noise going on. And of course, the level of noise could be different. Yeah, in the ideal case, it's very small. Yeah, I could here with this, uh, I can add or I can change the level of noise. So the, now noise would be very small, but in usually case, it's getting worse. Yeah? And you see, the higher the noise part gets, the more difficult it, it is even to recognize, ah, this was the initial signal. If the noise level is very small, we can immediately say, ah, okay, it looks like a sinus signal, looks similar to that. Okay, we can maybe reconstruct. If the noise getting higher, it is getting more and more difficult to overcome this noise. And you could not neglect noise by 100%, never. It is not possible. You will always have noise in your system to some extent. Now we need to talk a little bit about statistics, how statistics work. And for this, I would like to actually introduce the visualization in form of a histogram. Let me just briefly explain how this histogram looks like. In the histogram, we are noting down the occurrence of certain events. So let's assume, and I'm doing the very simple example of, that we are rolling a dice. Okay, I have a small uh, simulator for that. So we are rolling a, a dice. So we have six sides of the dice, which means that we can get a result from one to six. Okay, now let's assume this dice rolls would be measurements of our sensor. And what I would do is that I would categorize these measurements. So I have category one, two, three, four, five, six, because we have six possibilities with this dice. And on the y-axis, I'm noting down how often this measurement occurs. So for example, now you see I roll to one. So you see the frequency of a one is one because it happens once till now. So I now I can roll often, more often. And you see, of course, now it's a six. I note down a six. It's a six again. I note down a six again. We are a two. This would be a two and so on and so on. So why I'm interested to do so? I'm interested to do so to classify the behavior of my random process. 
Because as you know, if I'm rolling a dice, this would be also a random process which would happen. I do not know beforehand what side the dice will end up. And as you see, if I would do so, and I could now just let it roll automatically, and we are generating the histogram, and what you see is yeah, that, of course, we are ending up with a certain, let's say, histogram where all of the bars shall be more or less exactly the same. Now, there is some difference, yes, but this is due to the fact that for, a, for the dice, of course, the probability for each of the sides is the same. So if I would run for infinitive rolls, all of these bars of the histogram would be the same. And as you see, as longer as it keep running, they are leveling out. Yeah? They are leveling out. And we are more or less on the same page with all of these. This is what you call in statistics a uniform distribution. All of the cases could be is the same likelihood. This is usually not the case for measurements. In measurements, the errors are not uniformly distributed. They are following what is called a Gauss distribution. And in order to include the Gauss distribution, you also made, might heard of, or standard distribution, is <clears throat> that we make the example of if we would measure the height of all the people in a class. If we would measure the height of all the people in a class, maybe here with you, we have now 90 people in the group, and I would note down who of you is smaller than 150 centimeter, smaller than 160, smaller than 170, and so on and so on. You end up with a certain curve. And what is usually is that we see there are some of you which are smaller than the average. There are some of you which are much taller than the average. But most of you would lie in a certain range. And when we build the histogram, that means we have a certain <clears throat> value where we see most of you fit into that category. For example, me personally, I'm one, one meter 83. Um, for Germany, for man, this is the red curve for man with one, 183. I'm somewhere here. I'm more or less in the middle, maybe a little bit above average, but more or less in the middle. Yeah? Very few are, for example, bigger than or taller than one meter 90. Very few are smaller than one meter 55. Most of them are here. And this is the Gaussian distribution. And noise in measurement is also following these kind of distribution. Around the real value, we have the most measurements. But from time to time, we measure something completely wrong in the one, on the one hand or completely wrong in the, in the other hand. And this is the Gaussian distribution. And this brings me to the definition of different terms when it comes to sensors. <clears throat> I'm often hearing when I'm talking to um, industry and I'm asking, OK, we are developing a sensor for you. What are your goals? Every guy from industry tells us the same. The sensor needs to be accurate. OK, then I'm, we need to speak about the term accuracy. What means the term accuracy for us when it comes to defining a sensor? And for this, I make a, sh a small example. So let us assume we would play darts. So I would actually have a dartboard and I have different darts and I would throw the darts to the dartboards. And I ask different people to do so. And maybe I find one person who is actually throwing five darts to the board and he ends up with a result like that. This would be somebody who we could classify as a guy who is very precise in his darts row because he is always more or less hitting the same spot. Now you see almost hitting the same spot all the time. In measurement terms, we are talking about he's very precise. In terms of a sensor or a technical system, we would mean the, the system, the sensor would always deliver more or less the same value. We have a very good repeatability. But you might now, of course, say, yes, of course, uh, Mr. Aufdade said he's very precise, but of course, in darts game, we want to hit the bullseye in the middle, not somewhere here. And that is the problem 
he is very precise. He's hitting the same spot all the time, but it's the wrong spot. Yeah, maybe it's a, a one or a two and not the bullseye. So we say <clears throat> when it comes to the sensor, we have a certain error, a certain offset or bias, how we call it, where the measured values, um, where the measured values are lying. But the variation, the distribution is very small. We are almost hitting the same spot. Okay, now I take another person, please hit the darts, and he's hitting the darts like that. And there we would say, oh, he seems to be quite correct because the darts always around the middle, the bullseye, which we want to hit. But unfortunately, he's not very precise because he's just hitting in some cases in the middle or the others are somewhere around. This would be the opposite case where we say, okay, yeah, the mean value would be around the true value, but the deviation is quite huge. So here we are talking about, this is somebody who is quite correct from the mean value, but not very precise. So now I might ask you, when you can select a sensor, which is, for example, here the red one, which is precise but not correct, or you should uh, select a sensor which is correct but not precise. Which of the sensors you would prefer? Which would be the better one for you? Has somebody an idea? Just use the chat. Yeah. Do you would prefer a precise sensor or a correct sensor by using the terms I'm just I'm just mentioning here? Ah, most of you have the correct answer you choose the precise one. Why is this the case? Because the precise one is better because, yes, we know there is a certain deviation from the real value, but the variation is very small. And this provides us the possibility to compensate for that problem. If we know the error is always, for example, in terms of temperatures, five degrees, we could easily compensate if we always subtracting five degrees. Wow, we have a very nice sensor. And in an ideal way, of course, both categories come together that we are precise and correct. And usually you are doing it by finding a sensor principle, which is precise, not necessarily very correct, but precise. And you can then compensate the error in order to come up with the perfect sensor for a perfect um, example. Okay, we talked about a sensor. What is the sensor in general? Um, let us just give an introduction into the signal processing and maybe then it's good to have five minutes break or something like that, that you can go to toilet or whatever, <laughs> I guess, but just let us have a sh short start with signal processing techniques. So we know now two of, the, two of the problems is that our sensors is affected by noise. So the signal you are reading is not looking very nice. It's looking like this mess here, for example. And the second problem is that the sensor is affected by other errors. You cannot really compensate because noise is a random error. We could not control in an uh, could not control in an analytical way. And on the other hand, we have a certain deviation of the sensor principle itself, which we need to compensate. And therefore, I want to talk about two um, signal processing techniques. The one very important part is signal filtering which will be definitely part of your uh, basic courses in signal processing or wherever. And the other one is sensor fusion. And I will briefly introduce these topics and then come after the break to the um, case study where, where I'm showing how these elements are used. So what is a filter, a sensor filter in a sense? Um, you need to think about a filter for signal processing like a screening device. So let's assume you have these different kind of balls, bigger balls and smaller balls, or bigger particles and smaller particles. And you're just interested to have one of these categories, but unfortunately you have a bulk of material where both of these balls are in. So if I would give you the task, okay, please sort the balls, what you would probably build is I built a screener. I built a screener where I'm saying, okay, the small balls can fall down through a grid and the bigger balls cannot fall through the holes because the holes are smaller than the bigger balls and they go the other way. This is the definition of the screener. 
And in the same way, a signal filter is working. In a signal filter, we are saying, okay, we have now a signal which is affected by noise. And we have this filter which provides us the possibility to screen, so to say, the signal in terms of this is the, fil uh, the noise part, which we don't want to have, and this is the signal part. Of course, you might ask, OK, how is this possible? We are not talking about balls. We are talking about signals. <clears throat> it is easily possible by filters to classify a signal based on the frequency components. So that means that when we uh, talk about the frequency components of such a signal, now well, let's go back to our simulation. So what we can see. Um, I'm just asking your, let's say, your, your meaning or your understanding. So if we have a certain signal, this certain signal, here it's a sinusoidal curve, is affected or is uh, defined by a certain frequency. Yeah, you know, we, you, for a sign, you have the period time and the inverse of the period time would be the frequency of the signal. Um, here you see it's just 50 hertz at the moment and I can play around with it. Yeah, and then you see it's getting... You know, it's always uh, it's always showing the same. You need to look on the time scale here. Yeah. Now we have for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, periods. We have zero point one four seconds. If I'm decreasing the frequency, for example, to one hertz, now you see now we have seven sec se uh, seconds here. And if I'm increasing to whatever one hundred hertz, yeah, it is of course also changing again. It takes a while. Takes a while because it needs to go. <clears throat> yeah, this is the idea of. Oh, I changed the amplitude, not the frequency. <laughs> so now you see, now it's 0 0.07. So here, the signal usually has a certain frequency range, which you could expect. For example, if you're looking on the temperature in this room, we could expect that the frequency of change would not be very high, yeah, because temperatures are small, smallly changing. The noise part, since it's a random signal, usually has a much higher frequency. And that means that you can filter a signal by means of its frequency component, where you say, okay, the lower frequency shall pass my screen, my filter, and the higher frequency shall we shall get rid of. <clears throat> and this is what we call a low pass filter. Lower frequency can pass. Okay, and um, here on the other hand, we have now our filtering. This is a low pass filter, this is a high pass filter. You see from the symbol, yeah, for the low pass filter, the higher wave is crossed out. We want to get rid of the high frequencies. The high pass filter, the lower, um, wave is crossed out, we want to actually have the higher frequency part. And as you can see, of course, here I can define the frequency, the so-called cutoff frequency of a filter. And we see, okay, our signal has a frequency of 100 hertz. So that means everything above 100 hertz shall be filtered out, shall be screened out. So if I put the cutoff frequency, for example, to 110, you see, I have the ideal sinus curve back. And if I do the same for the high pass filter, you see, okay, this is just the noise part now in our, in our filter here. And this is the idea of filtering a signal. So just think about when you talk about low pass filter, high pass filter, filter like that, just think in your head about a screener. That is the screener we are talking about. <clears throat> and of course, you see that an ideal filter behavior would cut off all signal contents above a certain frequency for a low pass filter. And this frequency, where you're actually cutting the signal frequency, is called the so called cut off frequency, therefore. And all the frequencies you let pass is usually called the pass band. All the frequency you want to stop, you want to filter out, is the so called stop band. And this is what we are looking at is the so-called frequency response of a filter. 
And this looks very complicated. I just want to go into the details here. <coughs> um, of course, as you see on this slide, we are just thinking about the cutoff frequency like a so-called brick wall response. At this frequency, below everything goes through the filter, a frequency above will completely cut it off. This is not the case in reality, because based on the so-called filter order, you have not a 100% ideal flat brick wall response of the filter, but you have this kind of behavior. So you are not cutting off completely the frequency components above a certain frequency, but you're at least compensating a little bit. You're saturating a little bit. And the higher the order of the filter will be, the more close you get to the ideal brick wall response. Okay, so we know now, okay, with signal filtering, we can get rid of noise components how we can get rid of general errors in our perception. And for the general perception, we usually apply what we call sense of fusion. I used the term beforehand. Sense of fusion means, in general, when I just want to formulate it in a very easy way, if I have a sensor for a specific unit, and I know I cannot trust the reading of the sensor 100%, because it's affected by some kind of error, I usually can get a better result of the reading if I'm taking into consideration sensor readings from other sensors as well. <clears throat> so I add, add additional sensors and then I maybe have complementary information which I can fuse in order to get a more clear view about the value I want to talk about. And this I want to make let's say clear on a case study for visual inertial scene reconstruction right now but as promised i know i talked already for one hour so i would say we make a short five minutes break we all can go to toilet and i would say we continue let's say 12 15 if this is okay for everybody it's a little bit more than five minutes huh? okay everyone uh, thank you professor dominic for a very interesting uh, lecture so we shall have uh, about i think it's around seven to eight minutes uh, break so you can go to the toilet or you can just uh, if you are at home you can kiss your uh, partner and then yeah. come back to the laptop yeah very important very important don't forget to do that once in a while <laughs> okay i see you all I see you all in in five seven minutes All right, it's just less than one minute. We should start. Uh, Professor Dominic, there will there is a question uh, by Nicholas Albert. On yes, the, uh, maybe you can start with that, sir, before continuing. Yes, yeah. yes. I, I will start with... Actually, I will postpone the answer because this is a very, very good question <clears throat> because this fits more or less 100% to some of the contents I will just show. Maybe for the others, the, uh, sure. he asked whether the usage of extended Kalman filter is useful in order to reduce the error in uh, inertial navigation systems and LIDAR, uh, especially in the context of autonomous guided vehicles and uh, autonomous mobile robots and things like that. There's a very interesting question, very to the point of what I'm just will discuss just in a couple of minutes. So we have the question in mind and I will continue and we will speak about a case study for visual inertial scene reconstruction. Um, let me just give you a little bit the feedback of uh, this, um, let's say, topic. We at the Fachhochschule Südwestfalen, South Federal University, we are running a 3D printing center. So that means that we have a dedicated center which is equipped with all the 3D printers here you see for plastics, for metal, for all kinds of stuff. Uh, invest, we invested there a really couple of million euros in order to do so to provide the possibility to print all kinds of stuff for all kinds of projects. And what we actually perceived is at one point in time, okay, we have the ability in the field of rapid prototyping to actually print more or less all kind of prototypes with different materials, with different precision, with different kinds of um, um, dimensions. But what was a little bit missing or still is a little bit missing is the other side of things. Because usually when it comes to um, the wish of 
prototyping where you need a 3D printer at the end, there is also the wish that it is possible to capture real world objects as a 3D model, which might be then used in order to develop, engineer, design and manufacturers new stuff. And therefore, what we also worked on is the whole field of 3D reconstruction. So the idea is more or less that we want to be able to print any 3D surface, any 3D object, and we want to also be able to generate 3D models from each and every object we have. And what we want to do is that we want to do that with a small mobile sensor device instead of using complicated sensors like infrared scanners or something like that. And the aspect, as I said, is just that, for example, if you want to develop a new part for a specific automotive system, um, maybe you want to capture some real-world 3D data in order to transfer it to a CAD and then develop a new part for your automobile. And we developed the scheme which is called WISREC, Visual Inertial Sensor Fusion for Scene Reconstruction. And it's just based on a small standard camera and a set of inertial sensors. So we wanted to develop something which we can implement with low cost, really. And now you see, Mr. Uh, Mr. Albert, um, that your question is very related to that part because you want to do basically the same task in the field of uh, autonomous mobile robots, for example. And I will come to that in a minute. Because what we defined is, and I said that one of the major things we want to implement is sensor fusion scheme. And I broke it down here for this presentation a little bit that it's easy to digest. Here, we're talking about the sensor fusion scheme where we have a set of inertial sensors so three axis magnetometer, three axis accelerometer, three axis gyroscopes. This would be also the usually set of sensors which you want uh, would have included in a mobile robot, for example, in order to self-localize itself. And we have a standard low-cost camera in the first attempt. And we built a parallel visual inertial sensor fusion network with different dedicated cells, a visual fusion cell, an inertial fusion cell, and then the visual inertial fusion cell, which actually fuse sub-information generated. Okay, starting with the visual fusion cell, talking a little bit about the image processing computer vision side of things. So what we are going to do is that we want to have a small sensor, which is mainly based on a camera. And we want to capture the 3D model of any kind of object. Yeah, for example, I have here this nice, nice cup. I want to capture a 3D model of this cup. And the idea is, okay, I have a sensor and I move the sensor around the object to capture a 3D model of this cup. This is the idea. Technically, that means that we have a 3D object in our slide here, this small house. We have a camera because we're just talking about the visual side now. The inertial part comes later. We move a camera around the object. So that means that from any viewpoint, we generate an image of the object. So we see the object from different perspectives, basically. And why we are doing this and why this is helpful. As you all know, we want to get the 3D information of this object. And you all know how the human perception of three-dimensional information works. The human perception of a 3D scene works that we are seeing the same scene with two eyes. And as you all have tried, if you cover one of those eyes, your depth perception is not longer there. It suffers. Yeah, it's a classical example, you know, just try to, you know, get your fingers aligned. If you close one eye and you try it, it's more difficult for you to do so because the visual perception, the depth perception is not longer there. So, okay, now we know it is possible somehow that if we are looking at one scene, at one object from two different viewpoints to get an information, a perception of the three-dimensional structure of the object. If we are moving a camera around the object, 
we have always pairs of two images which show the same object. So basically we're doing the same, but of course from much more different viewpoints in order to cover a complete structure of the system. And the whole information is based on a so-called detection of features. So a feature in image processing is defined as any kind of image information which I can easily re-identify in the different images. So for example, we could talk about point features and these point features are distinctive points in the image I could always re-identify. I can always find in every image. So for example, these are points from the three-dimensional object which are easy to recognize. I would not cover the details here because just the a case of feature detection, selection, and tracking is very complicated. One, I want to, I don't want to touch it in too much detail here. So we we can assume, okay, we can detect these feature points in all the images, and when we can detect those feature points in all the images, we can match them. So then we know how a feature point through an image sequence is moving, and from this information, it is possible to derive two sets of information. One information is the motion of the camera. So we can derive how the camera has moved from one frame to the other. And we can derive the structure of the object. And here's an example. So you see the house and you see all the red dots. Which these are the features which are actually detected and matched. And then at the end, these feature points, points can be reconstructed in 3D. This is the 3D reconstruction of those feature points as you can see. here, Of course, you see not the complete structure of the image because this is a test sequence we did where we are just observing the house from one side. We are moving with an industrial robot and so on to have a comparable set of features all the time to um, <coughs> identify the weaknesses of our algorithm. But this is possible. Okay, so that means that if we are able to do so, we are able to reconstruct the three-dimensional structure of any object or scene just from a simple standard low-cost camera. The big problem is that this point tracking is unstable by nature. I'm always saying like that because as you can see is when, we, when you look at these points and now you would apply this to any kind of scene, you know that this is a very complicated task to do so. So this is an unstable problem. That means that it could be that there are frames in your sequence where you cannot find those features again and that would destroy basically your complete algorithm and now we know okay we have a, a sensor principle which is not 100 percent good we have some weaknesses and now the idea from sensor fusion comes in because we know okay if i'm probably not longer able to um, detect those features we could maybe use a different set of sensors. For example, a motion information we capture from inertial sensors. They measure a complete different thing. Now, with the camera, we are measuring mainly the reflective uh, reflectance of light of an object. So it's more or less an um, intensity sensor. Inertial sensors me measure things like acceleration, speed, stuff like that. A complete different set of sensor readings, but we can combine these information so that the overall information and depth perception will be better. And this brings us to the inertial fusion cell. And the inertial fusion cell is completely independent from the visual one in the first in this parallel setup. So we have a visual fusion cell, as I just said, and we are able to get an estimate of the motion of the system and the structure. Now we have the inertial fusion cell, which could also lead us to a motion estimation. So how the inertial system, the inertial sensor setup is defined, as I said, we have the three axis magnetometer, three axis accelerometer, and the three axis gyroscope. <clears throat> um, we need to be a little bit clear about what we are measuring here. Um, so I simplified a little bit for you. Let's just um, focus on the accelerometers and the gyroscopes and let's derive how a navigation algorithm would look like where we are interested to get to know the position of 
a certain sensor. And for this, maybe we can derive this a little bit together. So let's say um, I am simplifying that a little bit. I hope you see my, my whiteboard. Okay, um, so we have what we call three axis um, accelerometers as this first set of sensors. That means that we have a 3D coordinate system, x, y, that, with the different um, dimensions. And this three axis accelerometers measuring the transitional acceleration across all these axes. Yeah? So if I start moving it, I start accelerating it, and that is my sensor reading. So I get basically a vector, I call it A for acceleration, which contains the acceleration component in x direction, in y direction, and in that direction. Yeah, so basically, these kind of information, oh, that is of course AZ, this is AX, and this would be AY. This is the information I get from the accelerometers. <clears throat> okay, this is my first set, my first sensor set here. Now I have three axis gyroscopes. And for this, of course, we need, first of all, define, okay, what do I measure with a gyroscope? Somebody knows what we are measuring with gyroscopes, with which physical ent entity? Does somebody know that? Just use the chat in order to let me know. So here we are measuring accelerations across the three axes. Does somebody know what we are measuring with a gyroscope? Angular velocity, very good. Yes, angular velocity, very nice. So we are measuring the angular velocities around these axes. So we call it omega x, that, and y. Very good. So that means here we get also a vector with the angular, angular velocities as well. So this would be my second set of sensors. So let's just stick to that, simplify it a little bit. So now we have these two sensor readings. So how we are able now, if we want to know, I have a sensor equipped with these kind of readings and I want to know how it is moving through a three-dimensional space. I want to get the position of the sensor and the orientation of the sensor in a three-dimensional space. What would, be necessary, what would be necessary to do? So first, <clears throat> if we are talking here about angular velocities, and I want to get the orientation of a device. Now let's now assume, let's stick to one dimension. I hope you can see it. Yeah, I can, I can uh, turn it around this axis and I get the velocities. If I get the angular velocity and I want to have the angle, what do I need to do with this kind of reading? What do I need to do? I have the velocities, I want to have the absolute angles, the orientation. <clears throat> what do I need to do? I need to have an integrator unit. Yeah, if I'm integrating velocity, I'm getting position. If I'm, get, if I'm integrating angular velocity, I'm getting the orientation. This would be the orientation. Okay, then with the accelerometers, what do I need to do with the accelerometers? We have acceleration, but we want to get position. Uh, if I'm moving this through the three-dimensional space, I want to get position. What do I need to do? Shall be easy now, more or less. First of all, the general idea. Here we have speed and we want to get orientation. We need to integrate. Here we have acceleration and we want to get position. What do we need to do? Has somebody an idea? Double integral. Brian, perfect. Yeah, because if we would integrate once, we could, we could get the velocity. And if we integrate a second time, <clears throat> we could, could get the position. 
always as vectors because we're talking about three-dimensional case. <clears throat> um, but this is not 100% correct. That's okay. Now, when we say, okay, this would be position here, this is not 100% correct. Why? What do we need to take into consideration as well? From the general background, it's clear, but what do we need to take into consideration as well? Somebody knows or somebody has an idea what we forgot? <clears throat> yeah, we need to talk a little bit about coordinate systems when we do so. And I'm just doing it here. So let's assume we need to be a little bit, let's say, abstract. This is my measuring volume here. We are talking about a three-dimensional case. So we have, of course, a three-dimensional measuring um, volume. This is 3D. And within this volume, I have somewhere my sensor unit. This is the sensor unit here I'm drawing, moving around inside of this volume here. And of course, it is changing position, but it's also changing orientation, yeah? because I would not just move it down like this. Of course, I would also turn it around. Yeah. So, and now what is a little bit the problem is that we are talking about two different coordinate systems. <clears throat> because if we want to know the exact position and orientation of this object inside of this three-dimensional volume, our reference coordinate system is defined here. Oh, I'm doing it in a bigger scale that we see. That would be the definition here of my coordinate system which I want to use to define the position of the sensor yeah, with x, z, y. This is what we call the so-called world coordinate system. This is stick. Yeah? Somewhere here in the room, this is the coordinate system and this is fixed. The problem is now that all the sensor readings I'm getting are not inside of this world coordinate system. They are inside a local coordinate system of my sensor unit. And of course, as you see, if I'm moving this around and I'm rotating it, this coordinate system is not fixed. It is rotating together with your system. So that's why we can call this, this is the sensor coordinate system, for example. <clears throat> so, therefore, if we want to relate position and orientation into, inside of these two coordinate systems, what we need to do is that we need to have a little bit more complicated block diagram where we say, okay, from the gyroscope, we can estimate the orientation, but then we need to uh, transform the readings of say, accelerometers with the current orientation of the sensors to one fixed world coordinate system. Yeah? In the beginning, they might be aligned, but then if I'm rotating this, I need to actually transform the sensor readings always to the world coordinate system. And then I can do the double integration for the estimate, uh, estimation of position. And there is one small additional thing we need to discuss. Um, I'm talking about that we are measuring acceleration. The problem is that there is one acceleration component which we would also measure if we, I'm not moving this thing at all. And that is gravity. Yeah, you know, 9.81 meter per second square is gravitational acceleration, gravity. So, of course, I need to correct that because this is actually not causing any movement as long as I'm not le uh, leave this thing falling. So, therefore, I need to get rid of this gravitational correction. And this is the easiest navigation system based off inertial readings. And now I come back to what was the question of uh, Albert. What has Kalman filter to do with these kind of things? Um, 
I did not took this into consideration when I prepared the uh, presentation because it could be complicated. But the problem is that when your algorithm contains integration, there is one, one big problem. And this problem is drifting. Why is that so? So let us assume we are talking about a noise component in my acceleration readings. Okay, let's assume what would be the ideal sensor. The ideal sensor for the acceleration, if I'm not moving the sensor at all, I shall get acceleration readings which are exactly zero. Perfect. The problem is this would not be the case because we have noise inside of that system. So that means even if I'm not moving the sensor, my sensor reading will not be exactly zero all the time. It will have some noise component on it. And we talked about statistic beforehand. If the mean value of the noise component is exactly zero, then we have no problem because let's just assume so let's assume this would be our sensor reading, for example, AX over time. And this is zero. If we have noise, which is more or less homogeneously distributed about zero, so that means it's looking maybe like this a little bit. Integration would not be a problem because the positive parts and the negative parts are exactly the same. So the integration will end up with zero. Perfect. The problem is this is not the case in most sensor setups. In most sensor setups, your noise component will have um, some kind of component which is not which is not zero. So it will maybe look like wait a second. It will maybe look like um, that this green curve is a little bit moved to the positive side. So it will maybe look like this. Or it is moved to the negative side, it will look like this. And then you see what is the big problem. If you are integrating the signal twice, that means you are summing up the noise components all the time, all the time. And that would lead to a curve where your position here will actually drift away just due to the integral in your algorithm. And therefore, usually we are talking about these inertial navigation systems are not long-term stable, they are drifting away. And therefore, usually Kalman filter structures are used to automatically estimate the noise components and if you know a little bit about the Kalman filter approach, I don't want to go into the details here. The Kalman filter approach is basically mainly a comparison between a sensor reading, a continuous comparison of a sensor reading compared to a model which you have. And this you could do in order to reduce the effects of noise. And this is state of the art for these kind of navigational systems. So the answer to the question Albert was raising is Kalman filtering approach, extended Kalman filtering approach is very, very important in this sense. I could, if you are interested in, I could give you some, uh, some papers uh, I already uh, published decades ago, not decades ago, but years ago. <laughs> about uh, usage of Kalman filter in these kind of structures. Yeah, if you're interested, I will put it to the chat later on. When we're in the question section, I can look for it, no problem. Okay. So, back to our fusion scheme. So now we know, okay, we have the camera moving around, we get some motion estimation from the camera, and we have the inertial sensors, we get a motion estimation from the inertial sensors. Okay, so how does this help us now in our overall structure. This would be very easy that it can help us um, because what we have is that we have now a motion uh, information from two completely different sets 
of information. And that means that we can use this additional motion information in order to get rid of some of the problems. And you might know or might remember, we spoke about the problem with feature detection and tracking. And in order to maybe illustrate the difficulty of that task, what I was doing here is I'm having an example. So let us assume we want to track the corner of one of these images here. And what you're seeing is that the appearance of such a corner would change dramatically with the perspective I'm looking on that corner. So this is always the same image point, <coughs> physical image point, taken from different frames. And it looks always completely different. So and let, let us assume I want to find this patch in the image always. It would be very, very difficult for me to do so. But now, assume that we have the motion information available. And this was something we developed, which was called WIFTRAC, Visual Inertial Feature Tracking. And the idea is simple. <clears throat> so let us assume we want, to, uh, we want to find a certain feature point in the image again. So this red point, and we are considering to find that feature point, this green neighborhood of that pixel. Looks probably like that. Yeah, so, for example, let's assume we want to find that image point again, and that is the local neighborhood from the image. And now we have a new frame of the sequence, and of course, the perspective changed since we moved the camera. So that means that, of course, in order to find that patch again, we need to have some kind of a transformation of that patch. And now we have a motion information available, which is independent from the camera itself because it comes from the inertial sensors. And from that motion information, we can warp the image patch as it would look like when we move the camera that way. And this is what we call an affine photometric warp of the patch. So we are moving the affine transformation from the perspective, the camera movement, and we have a photometric model which also takes into consideration the reflectance of the object. And then it is very much possible to find those feature points again with a much higher stability than without using the inertial side of things. And this is a comparison. You will find a test sequence. All the red dots are feature points and the white lines are illustrating the vectors between two um, locations of of those feature points. On the left hand side, the blue hand side, you're looking at the results of the feature point detection and tracking without usage of inertial sensors, so just visual information. On the right hand side, the green hand side, you will look at the result when we take into consideration the inertial sensors and the photometric warp, the affine photometric warp. And what you can easily see is that on the left hand side, when I start to move the camera faster, I'm always losing all of the feature points. On the right hand side, where I use the inertial sensors to predict how these feature points will behave, they are much more stable and I'm able to actually track those kind of sensor movement. And this was a great success because with the usage of this approach, we were able to actually increase the stability of our system enormously, really enormously. So I just put uh, the link to the paper I'm just discussing in, in the chat. Mr. Albert, you can use it and all the others as well. <clears throat> And these are some results. For example, this is the 3D dimensional model we created from a test object. We have different test objects and we've uh, followed these approaches. And there's one problem with this uh, image representation, as you can see. Um, of course, we see that we have a three dimensional representation of the object. The problem is it is a quite sparse reconstruction because it depends on the number of feature points we can actually track. 
So it's not, let's say, 100% nice, so to say. So what we also did then is that we have an extended fusion network where we ext uh, added also beside the RGB camera a so-called time of flight camera, which gives us beside the color image a depth image of the scene. And with this additional knowledge, we would then be able to actually create also a dense representation, as I just see. There is another question. Yes, oh, yes, perfect question at this moment, because here um, Mr. Solistio asked about the possible or the inclusion of time of flight sensors, depth sensors into the phones. And that is exactly why we came up with this extension to our network. In the beginning, <coughs> we were just focused on a standard low cost camera. But over the time of the development of the project, the TOF cameras, time of flight cameras, or as they are called in general, RGBD, yeah, so you have the color information and you have the depth information, have become much cheaper, much smaller, so that they, we could also include them into our scheme. And I'm pretty sure the problem is with the sensors in your camera, which are installed. For example, um, I think one of the prominent examples for the iPhone is that you have this kind of face ID, yeah, where you I don't need to enter my code if I want to unlock my phone, I just need to look into the sensor and it will unlock the phone. This is based on a time of flight sensor, on a depth sensor, because in comparison to some of the Android based phones, they are not looking at the color image of your face to recognize you, they are looking on the 3D shape of your face in order to recognize you. So this is one of the usages, for example. The problem with these kind of sensors here is that they have a quite poor performance when it comes to really metric reconstruction. Because what we want to do is just have in mind, we want to reconstruct technical things. And there we need to talk about a certain let's say, reconstruction accuracy in the terms of millimeters. And this is very difficult with these small scale and cheap low price sensors. That is the problem. Yeah. But you are right that, of course, with the development of these mass market applications of these time of flight sensors, they become cheaper, the technology, technological um, background becomes available, and that's why we decided to include. So perfect uh, time for that question. And even if we include the, the depth sensor, the difference is now that we are still moving the camera around, but now we get beside the color image also a depth image, which is mainly a point cloud. Yeah, the point cloud which represents the depths of the object. We are talking here about, usually this is referred to not as 3D information, this is referred to 2.5 dimensions, yeah, because you are not getting the full 3D information, but you're becoming 2D and the depths. And there you have the same problem. You have different 3D point clouds, which you need to actually combine in order to get the full model. And this is typically done by what is called an iterative closest point algorithm. And the iterative closest point is trying, based on the 3D information, to combine the different point clouds. The problem is this works quite well if you have enough structure in your point cloud. For example, here, when you're looking on the face, when you have the nose and the eyes and the nostrils and everything, it's easy, it works. But on the back, you have not so much information. So therefore, you could end up with such problems. Now that the fusion of point clouds, it's not working well, as you obviously see here. So, but there, also our visual inertial fusion scheme works because we could now also include also include now the intensity point features and the inertial information in order to optimize the fusion of the point cloud information and this is then one example of the dense model created from a test object uh, which we created, uh, which is from the reconstruction point of view, we are talking about uh, three to four millimeters in error. Um, so it is okay. We would just work on an uh, improvement later on. 
Yes, uh, Albert, you are completely right. Um, most of the leader in phones are already utilizing also inertial information. Yeah? So they are doing the same trick, more or less. You are right. Okay, so, and then we finally met the, uh, met the goal we all ultimately had. And as you see, just based on this case study, and this is why I like to show it, how powerful sensor fusion is when you use it in a reasonable way, but on the other end also, how complicated it could be to realize. And this brings me to my conclusion of the talk. Because all we discussed earlier today was just from the technological point of view about these are the sensors, these are the algorithms from the signal processing side we are using in order to receive or achieve a goal. What is really Im important also is to always consider that <clears throat> at the end, we want to generate a new sensor, a new system, a new setup. Albert brought the example with the mobile robots, for example, which is not, for example, where we are not able to include any kind of powerful processor, for example. And that means that we need to take into consideration if we are doing developments like that, that, okay, the sensing part is important, the algorithmic part is important, and then we have the implementation part as well. And this brings us to the term of the embedded system implementation. Because at the end, everything we are developing needs to run on a dedicated hardware platform. Of course, we are lucky because we are living in a time where the embedded systems we are working on are very powerful. Now, here, for example, I have a Raspberry Pi. I think most of you already uh, maybe have worked with it, so it is a very powerful computing unit. But nevertheless, when it comes to the design of a final product, we need to take into consideration that we have always limited resources. Yeah, for example, we may take the example of the mobile robot. Maybe we have limited resources about memory we have available, about processing power, about battery, so that means power supply, power consumption dimensions, size, and so on and so on. And of course, the systems we are creating, the systems we are developing, are driven by those kind of limited resources. And this is the really system view we need to take into consideration. Yes, we need to have sensors, we need to have a processor, and we need to have all the other stuff which defines at the end a final embedded complex system. And this is one of the very important aspects you should take into consideration when it comes to the development of a product later on. From an algorithmic point of view, from a sensing point of view, you can basically do anything. You can build as complex systems as you like. The problem is, and I think the industrial engineers here in the, in the room knows quite well, at the end you have some limited resources which are driven also on economic factors. And especially when we talk about autonomous driving, you are dealing with the automotive industry. And you can believe me, when you develop a technical system for an automotive company, this is really the biggest pressure you can get. Because there, they're optimizing all of their gadgets, all of their technical products they want to buy from a sub-supplier, really not in terms of cents, but in terms of hundreds of a cent. You need to be cheaper, you need to be faster, you need to have lower power consumption, you need to be smaller, and so on and so on. And this you also need to take into consideration when it comes to the development. Yeah, what's more to come? I hope I was able to give you an overview of how important sensor technology is for the realization of complex systems. and. I'm not talking uh, about just my impression or my subjective uh, thinking. It is also the case that when you look on the numbers, that this is already true. And here, for example, we see some seven drivers of sensor technology um, actually identified by analysts, where they say, okay, the growing adoption of the Internet of Things will actually skyrocket sales of sensors and will skyrocket development of new sensors. Consumer electronic products becoming more and more important when it comes to the sensory point of view. Um, smartphone, of course, um, you already mentioned, Mr. Albert mentioned, and also 
Mr. Solistio, you mentioned that, of course, consumer electronics like smartphones is really going. And the whole part of wearables, we, I haven't touched this topic at all. I, um, you have seen that we have also project in gesture and um, um, activity recognition. There we are working with wearables, so things you include in your, in your clothes which is a very important thing. You know, all these fit, fitness trackers and the, um, the eye, uh, eye watch and stuff like that. So very important. And of course, the automotive industry. And these are the sensor sales just in the US, I guess. This is the statistic just from the US over the next years. So we are in <clears throat> 2011 and this is the forecast for the next years. And you see that just in probably when we are uh, at the moment talking about four or five billion, just in the course of maybe five years, this will double due to the fact that there are numerous new branches who are now equipping sensors. I give you an example from my personal experience. <clears throat> as I said, we are working together with agricultural companies as well. And there, 10 years ago, they haven't included any kind of sensors in their products. Now, I get contacted almost every month with a new idea how we can add sensor technology to their products in order to increase the functionality of what they're actually developing. So this was really will really skyrocket through the next years. Yeah, and this is more or less on time, the end of my guest lecture. Uh, let me just say it was a great honor to be here, a great honor to be invited, great honor to do it with you, 94 participants, very, very nice. And of course, I'm open for questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Dominic. It was very, very interesting, very nice. And I hope everybody is, uh, is enjoying that, uh, learn something from that. So like Professor Dominic was saying that if you are still uh, wanting to ask questions, uh, feel free to do so. While you are preparing your camera, we are going to take a uh there was one chat uh, saying oh yes we enjoy that says altius uh same here altius anybody would like to ask question please do so you can write in the chat or you can just directly uh talk all right uh i will also write my email in the chat so if you oh, have please do so yeah, you can also write me an email about this when you have any specific questions and so on. I know it was a lot of information in two hours. Uh, yes. Yeah. All right. I guess uh, nobody else would like to ask uh, if if it is okay to to uh, stop sharing, Prof, so that we can have a all uh, gallery view, so that yes. we can have now. A photo session can everyone turn on your camera please so we can have a uh, there is a question from Alang. will we receive the recording it will be on youtube also so you can you can watch it again on youtube Alang. okay if you want to re see that uh, uh that again okay who's going to take the photograph butanika is jessica is it jessica Pak. okay Okay, can you uh, uh, do the command, uh, Jessica? Uh, sure, wait. Uh. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is for the first layer. Yes. Uh, one, two, th three. For the next page. Next page. One, Smile. Two, oh. For the third page. Third page. Smile again. And for the last, the fourth page. Yeah, the last page. Smile again, everyone. Okay. It's okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dominic. Uh, thank you very much. It was an honor. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I wish you all the best. I hope to see a lot of you soon somewhere yeah. else. Okay. 
But before that, Prof, uh, I would like to ask uh, Ibu Tanika to say something, please, to do a closing, please, Ibu Tanika. Yeah, it seems I... Okay, here it is. Okay, Prof Dominic. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was very uh, enlightening. Yeah, it's very a uh, lot of information that we can get from there. Actually, we also have a lot of questions, but in the end, we don't know which one <laughs> should be delivered to you. I okay. know it was a lot. Many, yeah, so many information. Yeah, yeah, I know it. Yeah, we really hope that this is not the last one, yeah, Prof. Hopefully, we will uh, be able to meet in some other uh, opportunity, yeah. occasion. Every time. I will uh, look forward to it. Hopefully, uh, you are available for the other session of guest lecture, Prof. Sure, sure. Every time. Okay, Prof. Just like you see on okay. the chat uh, section. Uh, the student also very happy with the information. Thank you all. Thank you all. It was a great pleasure. It was a great honor. Thank you all. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> okay. okay, take care, stay healthy, and hope to see you all soon. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Thank, thank you, Buddha. Thank, thank you, Pamaris. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. 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 Thank you